As many, as many of you know, I came to faith in Jesus Christ while I was a freshman at the University of South Florida. At the time of my conversion, I was preparing to be a sports journalist. I enjoyed writing and I loved sports, so I thought, you know, I'd just combine the two and try to make a career of it. But by my sophomore year at South Florida, I had begun to lose interest in pursuing sports journalism as a vocation. As I grew in my faith, I, I also grew in my hunger and my desire to know the Bible. And it was during that time that I, I began to sense in my heart a longing to teach the Bible. But the problem was I didn't have enough knowledge uh, of the Bible to teach it, nor did I know how to teach it. And so through the advice of my pastors at the time, I decided to go to the Moody Bible Institute in Chicago in order to prepare for the ministry. I spent three years at Moody being trained so that I could be a competent pastor and teacher, at least attempt to be one. Academically, though, I tell you, those years were grueling. They were extremely difficult. Not coming from a Christian background, I was really unfamiliar with so many things related to the Bible and Christianity. Even, even terminology just was foreign to me. I took numerous courses at Moody in theology, in individual books of the Bible, Greek language, Bible study methods, course called hermeneutics, which is really how to interpret the, the Bible, the science of interpreting the Bible, Christian education, believe it or not, music, also church history, and numerous preaching classes. In addition, I was given weekly ministry assignments that involve preaching and rescue missions and doing one-on-one -on -one campus evangelism. All in all, as I said, those years at Moody were extremely challenging. In, in fact, I, I found Moody to be so academically demanding that after I graduated for six months, I had reoccurring nightmares that I had an assigned paper to turn in, and I hadn't, hadn't done it. But uh, that, that happened for about six months. I would wake up thinking, oh, I'm glad it was only a dream. They can't take back my degree. I did the work. But regardless of how challenging those years were, I have never regretted those years at Moody because they helped to prepare me for the ministry I've been involved in and doing for the past 37 years. See, preparation for ministry is never wasted time. It is time well spent because those who would minister in Christ's name need to be equipped to properly minister. That's not to say that every Christian must have formal training in a Bible college or seminary in order to serve the Lord, but everyone who hopes to effectively minister for Christ does need to have some type of training, even if it only comes from reading the right books and being discipled by someone who knows what he or she is talking about. See, no one can just step into ministry without some type of training and preparation. And that includes even our Lord's apostles, which is what the opening section of the book of Acts is about. As you'll recall, last week we began to study the book of Acts. And we discovered that Luke wrote this book specifically to a man named Theophilus as a second volume to his first volume, the initial account of the life and ministry of Jesus, which we call the Gospel of Luke. Notice how the first two verses of Acts begin. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven after he had, by the Holy Spirit, given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now, in these opening verses, he makes it clear, Luke makes it clear that his gospel account, the gospel of Luke, his gospel accounts of Christ's life was all about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up to heaven, until the day he returned to the Father. And during this time, meaning his earthly ministry, 
Luke says Jesus was giving orders to the apostles. Those are the 12 men that he had chosen to be his special representatives. You see what Jesus was doing with these men during his three years with them. He was training them. That's why he was giving them orders, training them to carry on his work after he returned to heaven. In other words, he was giving them a three-year Bible college education as he taught them truth and he modeled before them how to live out the truth. But even with all of this training from Jesus, they still were not ready to minister in his name. And the reason we know this is because Jesus did not immediately send them out to minister after he rose from the dead. Notice what Luke tells us in verse 3 of Acts 1. To these, meaning the apostles, he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Now, according to Luke, Jesus spent 40 days after he rose from the dead appearing to his apostles. As we noted last week, this doesn't mean that Jesus was with them for 40 consecutive days, but rather that he appeared to them in intervals so that he would just show up unannounced. He'd give them instruction, he'd teach them, and then he would just disappear until the next time he appeared to them and taught them something else. So this took place, Luke tells us, over a 40-day span of time, which ended when he finally ascended back to the Father. And what he was doing during those 40 days was giving them the final touches of preparation as he prepared them to be his witnesses. See, even with all the instruction that these men had been given by the Lord for the last three years, as I said, they were not ready yet to witness to a hostile world. They weren't ready to face opposition to the gospel message without Christ's bodily presence. They weren't ready to encounter the kind of anger and hatred that awaited them from antagonistic unbelievers. They needed more training, and that's what Jesus gave them during these 40 days. And his purpose in doing this was to prepare them for what? To be his witnesses all around the world. That's the point of verse 8. But you will receive power, Jesus said, when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, all Judea, Samaria, and even to the remotest part of the earth. In about a month and a half, they would begin to be his witnesses, starting in Jerusalem, and we'll see that when we come to Acts chapter 2. It's about a month and a half away, not the pace that we go necessarily, but I'm talking about a month and a half away from the time Jesus taught them. But until then, they need it. Until that time would come, they needed to be taught some essential truths by the Lord, and then they'd be ready to be his witnesses. And folks, that's what this opening section in Acts chapter 1 is, is really about. It's about the Lord making sure his apostles understood some very important, very essential truths so that they would be effective in their witness for him. And that's why these opening verses in Acts are so very important. Because after telling us in the first two verses that this book was written to Theophilus in order to explain how Jesus continued to teach and acts through the apostles after he returns to the Father. Luke then takes verses 3 through 9. I know I only read up to verse 8, but 9 is included in this section. He takes verses 3 through 9 to lay out several vital, essential truths that the apostles needed to understand to be equipped to effectively witness for Christ. And what makes this very important for us is because these are exactly the same vital, essential truths that we need to understand if we're going to be effective witnesses for our Lord. See, although these men were Christ's apostles, and therefore they were unique. We are not apostles. They were unique because they saw and they experienced things that you and I will never see and experience in this lifetime. And they were given certain abilities and they were given authority that you and I will never have. Nevertheless... When it comes to being a witness for Christ, 
We really are the same as these men. What they needed to learn from Jesus is exactly what you and I need to learn from him. See, witnessing is simply telling someone else what you know to be true. That's all it is. It's telling someone else what you know to be true. So it really makes no difference if you are an apostle who has seen Jesus in the flesh, or you are a Christian today who has experienced salvation without seeing Christ in the flesh, you still need to know certain essential truths in order to be effective in your witness for him. Now, last Sunday, we only had time to look at one of these essential truths that Jesus taught his apostles during this 40-day period of time, which is this, that to be an effective witness, they needed to be convinced that he was alive, that he had risen from the dead. Notice verse 3. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Let's stop there. Now, as we learned last week, these appearances to his men during this, these 40 days were important because they accomplished some very significant things. First of all, his many appearances convinced these men that he was really alive. That's the point. Notice how Luke words this in verse 3. He says, by many convincing proofs. In other words, Jesus kept appearing to the apostles over and over and over again to them and speaking to them for 40 days in order to persuade them that he who had been murdered and then placed in a tomb dead, he was now alive. That's what he was doing. See, understand this, none of these men had actually witnessed the resurrection. Nobody, no human being saw Jesus rise from the dead. No one. He just slipped through his grave clothes, now in a glorified body, and he walked out of the tomb. He walked right through the large stone that sealed the tomb. They hadn't been there. They never saw it happen. So they needed to be convinced that he really was alive. And initially, I want you to know, the men did not believe that he was alive, even though they were told by some women, followers of Jesus, that he was alive. Notice what Luke tells us in his gospel account, chapter 24, verses 1 through 11. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, meaning certain women, came to the tomb bringing the spices which they had prepared. And they found the tomb, found rather the stone, rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men suddenly stood near them in dazzling clothing. These are two angels. And as the, men, and as the women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living one among the dead? He's not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you while he was in Galilee, saying that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words, and returned from the tomb, and reported all these things to the eleven, that's the eleven apostles, because Judas has been eliminated, and to all the rest. Now, they were, here's the, here are the names of the women, Mary Magdalene and Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, also the other women with them, were telling these things to the apostles. Now, notice verse 11. But these words appeared to them as nonsense, and they would not believe them. So even though these women told the apostles that the body of Jesus was not in the tomb, and that the angels had told them that Christ had risen from the dead, they thought, the apostles thought, that the women were speaking nonsense, they refused to believe them. Now, it's these same men, the apostles, that Jesus kept appearing to over and over again during this 40-day period of time. In order, why? To drive out their doubts. They had doubts. To drive out those doubts and to drive home the truth of his resurrection, not just at a surface level, but deep into their souls. So they would have firm convictions and absolute certainty and assurance about this truth. you got to nail this one down. And these men got it because one of the truths that they kept emphasizing as they witnessed about Jesus was that he was raised from the dead. 
Notice, for example, on the day of Pentecost, Peter, Peter says this to this Jewish crowd, large Jewish crowd, this Jesus God raised up again to which we are all witnesses. We are witnesses to his resurrection. He raised him up. We have seen the Lord. He said the same thing to another Jewish crowd a little bit later in Acts 3, 15. But you put to death the prince of life, the one whom God raised from the dead, a fact to which we are witnesses. And then in chapter 5, starting in verse 27, the apostles are in front of the highest Jewish council known as the Sanhedrin, but they're not intimidated. They're not going to back down. These men are absolutely convinced of Christ's resurrection. And so we read when they had brought them, they stood them before the council. Remember, the council has the authority to bring them again to Pontius Pilate and have them all crucified. The high priest questioned them, saying, we gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, we must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus. Notice, they go right to the resurrection. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He's the one whom God exalted to his right hand, which is another way of saying that he's been raised from the dead, as prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Listen, if you find it difficult to witness to a non-Christian, then you need to think deeply about the fact, the truth of Christ's resurrection. Even though you cannot physically see Jesus, you have to take by faith this glorious truth that he is alive. And when you're speaking to someone about the Lord, you need to remember you are speaking not about a historical figure alone, you are speaking about a living person, one who is right there with you, who's, who's promised to never leave you and never forsake you, and one who has promised to give, to give you grace and wisdom even when your witness for him is rejected. He's there. So be encouraged in your witness for Jesus. He really did rise from the dead. He really is alive. He really is active in your life, and he really is with you in every difficult witnessing situation you faced. Believe it. Count on it. Be persuaded of it. So, the first essential truth that Jesus taught the apostles in order to equip them to be effective witnesses and a truth that, that is necessary for us to believe and count on deep in our souls is that he was alive, having been raised from the dead. They absolutely, and, and we do too, need to be clear on this issue. But our Lord's appearances to his apostles during these 40 days, they were important because they accomplished something else. You see, in addition to convincing them that he was alive, at the end of verse 3, Luke tells us that Jesus had another reason for appearing to these men over this 40-day time span. He tells us that Jesus was giving them instruction on a specific subject. And it was this instruction that reveals the second essential truth that these men needed to know in order to be effective witnesses, and one that we need to know as well. What was it? They needed to understand the content of their message. That's important. You have to know what you're saying. Notice verse 3 again, paying attention in particular to the last, last few words. To these he also presented himself alive after his suffering by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days, watch this, and speaking, here's what he spoke about when he was with them, of the things concerning the kingdom of God. Luke tells us that whenever Jesus appeared to his apostles over the course of these days, he spoke to them about the kingdom of God. So the question is, what does that mean? What does that mean, the kingdom of God? Essentially, the kingdom of God is a reference to God ruling as king over the lives of his people. In other words, the kingdom of God is Christ himself reigning as king over the hearts of believers. Wherever the king is, that's where his kingdom is. 
Wherever he rules, that's where his kingdom is. Now, this message of the kingdom of God is precisely the message that Jesus came preaching to the Jewish people. This isn't anything new. It was first proclaimed by John the Baptist because his role, as you'll recall, was to prepare the nation of Israel to receive their Messiah King. And then John introduced Jesus to the nation as the Messiah King. Notice that the very first thing that we read about John the Baptist in terms of his actual ministry to Israel is a message of the kingdom that is about to arrive in the person of Messiah. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now in those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. He's telling the people, Repent, the king is coming. So repent. Turn from your sin. The kingdom of God is about to appear right before you. And at the very start of our Lord's ministry, his message was exactly the same as John's. Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, he was saying that he, the promised king of the Jewish people, had arrived. He had come to capture the hearts of those who would submit to him as their sovereign king. He's telling them, I'm here. So repent. Listen, Christ's message throughout his three-year ministry was this very truth. He was king, and if anyone would follow him, they needed to recognize him as king and yield to his authority as king over them. Now, he may have used different words, like he was their lord, he was their rabbi, they needed to follow him, but that's the essence of it. I'm your king I'm here to have you follow me as I capture your heart to submit to my authority as your king. This is why the Sermon on the Mount is so very significant because the Sermon on the Mount, it is Jesus Christ as king teaching his disciples how to live as citizens of his kingdom. That's why so much of his teaching in this sermon addresses the heart and, and the motives of the heart, the intentions of the heart, and attitudes over which he must rule as their king. This is a very different sermon from what the Jewish people were used to. They were used to pharisaical outward conformity to a bunch of rules. Jesus is telling them, as your king, I address the heart. I don't want simply external conformity to some rules. I want your heart. That's the kind of kingdom I rule over. And so we read, for example, starting in Matthew 5, at verse 20, For I say to you, that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll not enter the kingdom of heaven. Why? The scribes and the Pharisees had no true righteousness. The scribes and the Pharisees just did a bunch of outward conformity to rules. Not true righteousness. Verse 21, you've heard that the ancients were told, meaning... People, your, your ancestors were told this, you shall not commit murder. And whoever commits murder shall be liable to the court. Now Jesus is saying that's what they were taught. That this commandment about murder is simply physically killing someone. It doesn't go any further than that. He said, but I say to you. Now he's not changing the law. He's explaining to them the original intent of the law. Remember, he is the lawgiver. Who is it who gave Moses the law? It is Christ himself. So he's saying, but I say to you, here's the true interpretation about murder. Everyone who's angry with his brother shall be guilty before the court. That murder also takes place in your heart, he's saying. Whoever says to his brother, you good for nothing, shall be guilty before the Supreme Court. And whoever says, you fool, shall be guilty enough to go into the fiery hell. What he's saying is, in my kingdom... Issues of the heart matter, not just outward stuff. See the same thing in verses 27 and 28. You've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you, once again, he's not changing the law. He's explaining the original intention of the law, which addresses the heart. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. See, Christ's kingdom is a spiritual kingdom an invisible 
kingdom in which he reigns supreme over the hearts of his followers. It's not merely outward performance of righteousness like the Pharisees practice. That's not what Jesus wants. His kingdom is a kingdom where the king searches people's hearts, inward motives. It isn't enough that citizens of his kingdom do the right thing. They must do the right thing for the right reasons. This is why as we move into chapter 6 of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus directly speaks of our motives in doing what is right. Notice chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. This is so important. You'll, you'll understand his kingdom and how he rules over us. If you understand this, beware, he said, of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. The Pharisees always made sure that people were around whenever they did a righteous deed because they wanted the applause of men and so often were just like them. Jesus said in verse 2, so when you, this is an example of practicing righteousness just before God. So when you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets so that they may be honored by men. Truly, I say to you, they have their reward in full. If you're going to give to help somebody who's poor, don't blow a trumpet and call attention to yourself. Say, would the Pharisees really do that? Absolutely, they would really do that. They wanted everybody to know how pious they were. Jesus is saying, if that's all the reason you do good deeds to others, if, if you give to the poor so that others will applaud you, well, you've got your reward because they've applauded you. That's it. Nothing more from God. That's it. Our Lord repeats this principle in verses 5 and 6, again in verses 16 through 18 concerning praying and, and fasting. He's challenging his followers to do these things, but not to do them to be seen by people and applauded by people, but do them privately to honor God. Now, if others find out about it, well, that's not your motivation. It just happens. But do these things to honor the Lord. See, being a part of Christ's kingdom means that he is Lord over every area of your life, including the intentions of your heart. And that kingdom, I want you to know, it exists right now. It's made up of all those who have bowed their wills to, to Christ as king over their lives. doesn't matter what denomination they, they're in. doesn't matter what church organization they go to. doesn't matter where they live in the world. If they have trusted Christ and bowed to him as Savior and Lord as their king, then they are a part of his kingdom. But listen very carefully, because while the kingdom of God does exist right now in its spiritual form, because, as I said, it exists wherever Jesus reigns as king in the hearts of his followers, I want you to know that there is also a future physical aspect of his kingdom that has not yet arrived, but will come when the Lord returns and establishes an earthly kingdom over which he will reign supreme. This is commonly known as the millennial kingdom, millennial meaning a thousand years. Why do we call it that? Because in Revelation chapter 20, it reveals that this earthly kingdom will last for about a thousand years, and then after that, it will merge with God's universal kingdom. See, throughout the Old Testament, there were some very specific promises given to the Jewish people concerning a coming kingdom on earth in which Messiah will personally reign and physically rule over. A government, an earthly government with him as the head. We read about this kingdom, for example, and there are many, many statements in the Old Testament about this, but here's just a few. For example, we read in Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. This is not simply about the Christmas message. We read, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest, notice this, on his shoulders. This is an earthly kingdom. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. There will be no end, watch this, to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it to uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Now, when he speaks of the throne of David, 
in his kingdom. David ruled over an earthly kingdom. Messiah, his greatest son, as well as his Lord, is going to rule over an earthly kingdom as well. Once again in Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 10, there's going to be changes on the earth, physical changes, changes in nature. We read about this, starting in verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little boy will lead them. Also the cow and the bear will graze, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play in the hole of a cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. That's not happening now. They will not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the water, waters cover the sea. Then... In that day, the nations will resort to the root of Jesse. The root of Jesse is, de- is, is Jesus, who will stand as a signal for the peoples, and his resting place will be glorious. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 44, this is significant because Daniel deals with Gentile kingdoms that will come, and then they'll, they'll go, and another kingdom will replace them. So in the context of a political, earthly kingdom, we read this. In the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom which will never be destroyed, and that kingdom will not be left for another people. It will crush and put an end to all these kingdoms, but it will itself endure forever. So, folks, I want you to know these are some very specific promises about a very specific physical kingdom that will exist on earth. It doesn't exist now, but it will, with the government residing in the sovereign reign of Messiah the King. He will rule out of the city of Jerusalem. Now, going back then to the book of Acts, it was during those times, we read, that Jesus met with his apostles after his resurrection and before his ascension, that Luke tells us that the Lord was speaking to them of the things concerning the kingdom of God. So the question that we are faced with is this. Was Jesus speaking during those times about his spiritual kingdom as he reigns today spiritually over the hearts of his people? Or was he speaking about his future earthly kingdom reign when he will reign both spiritually and physically over people? Well, Luke doesn't really tell us. He doesn't answer that. He doesn't say anything more than he spoke to them of the things concerning the kingdom of God. However, it must have been both the present spiritual and coming physical kingdom that Jesus was teaching them about. And the reason I can confidently say that is because when you go through the book of Acts, you see that the apostles spoke about both the present spiritual aspect of the kingdom as well as the future millennial earthly kingdom. And so whatever they said about the kingdom would certainly have been a reflection of what Jesus had taught them during this 40-day appearance or these 40 days that he appeared to them. What they taught about the kingdom was a reflection of what he had been teaching them. For example, we find, we find his followers speaking of the kingdom in its present form of Christ meaning that he's spiritually reigning over people's lives today. We see this, for example, in Acts chapter 8, verse 12. We, we read about Philip, who was one of the first deacons from the church at Jerusalem. We read this, Philip being in Samaria, when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> they were baptized, men and women alike. So Philip came to Samaria, and what did he preach to them? The kingdom of God. That's what he told them about. Same thing is true of Paul's preaching in Acts chapter 19, verse 8. And he entered the synagogue and continued speaking out boldly for three months, reasoning and persuading them about the kingdom of God. What was Paul preaching? About the kingdom of God. Not speaking about a future kingdom at that point. He's speaking about right now. The gospel message of the kingdom. Again, we see Paul preaching about the kingdom of God in Acts chapter 20, verse 25, as he meets with the elders from the church at Ephesus. We read this, and now behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will no longer see my face. Paul is telling them, you're not gonna see me anymore, but as you look back at my ministry, remember it, I preached to you about the kingdom of God. And that's the 
That's the spiritual kingdom he's talking about. But I want you to know he also spoke, the Lord spoke about this, and so the apostles spoke of the future earthly millennial kingdom as well. Perhaps not as much as the spiritual kingdom, because most of the book of Acts deals with Gentiles hearing the gospel message, not Jewish people, just a little bit about Jewish people. And an earthly kingdom would only be familiar to Jewish people. Gentiles wouldn't have any frame of reference about a, a coming kingdom. But before the gospel, before the gospel went to the Gentile world, which we find in Acts chapter 10, Peter very definitely spoke of a future coming earthly kingdom. He said this to a Jewish crowd. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 17. Now he's speaking to a crowd of Jewish people in the city of Jerusalem. And now, brethren, I know that you acted in ignorance, just as your rulers did also. But the things which God announced beforehand by the mouth of all the prophets, that his Christ would suffer, he has thus fulfilled. Therefore, repent. He's calling the Jewish nation, the people, to repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order. Notice this that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send Jesus, the Christ appointed for you, whom heaven must receive until the period of restoration of all things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from ancient time. Now, what I want you to notice about Peter's message is that he uses two expressions here that describe the millennial kingdom. First, he calls it the times of refreshment because it will be a time when God himself will banish Israel's enemies and pour out great blessings upon a converted Jewish nation. Secondly, Peter calls the millennial kingdom the period of restoration because it will be a time when God will restore his people to all of the blessings that he had promised to give them if they would obey him as a nation. Like what kind of blessings you might think? Well, blessings of peace, prosperity, justice, freedom from the oppression of their enemies, and on and on it goes like that. See, what Peter was saying to these Jewish people was that if they as a nation, as a people, would repent and turn to Christ, turn to their Messiah as their king, then God would usher in his earthly kingdom right then and there. Jesus would return and set up his kingdom right then and there. So you can't have an earthly kingdom without the Messiah reigning as king. You can't have a kingdom without the king. So as long as they refuse to repent and accept Christ, then there would be no kingdom, no times of refreshment, no period of restoration. In fact, it seems pretty obvious that when Jesus spoke to his apostles about the kingdom that his teaching included instruction about a coming earthly kingdom. I say that because just a few verses later, as you look back to Acts chapter 1, notice, notice verse 6, what we read. So when they had come together, this is the Lord's apostles, had come together, they're speaking to Jesus just before he, he leaves them. When they had come together, they were asking him, saying, Lord, is it at this time you are restoring the kingdom to Israel? See, these men are still thinking about a political, earthly kingdom in which the Messiah would reign out of Jerusalem over Israel, over the nations of the world. And why would they ask this? Because Jesus had been talking about this. He had been talking about this, and they wanted to know, is this the time? Well, it turns out it wasn't the time, but they were very right in asking this only because he had brought it up. Now, let's back up and let's think about why Jesus would spend 40 days speaking to these men about the kingdom of God. After all, he, he has already spent three years teaching them about the kingdom. So what did they need to know now about the kingdom that they didn't already know? Why teach them now? Didn't they know everything? No, they didn't. You see, there were some very significant things that they needed to know about the kingdom that they would have been very confused about had Jesus not given them some clarification and some more specific instruction. For one thing, the apostles needed to know that Christ's suffering and Israel's rejection of him as a nation 
that did not nullify salvation and an earthly kingdom that had been promised to the Jewish people. They needed to understand that. In other words, Israel's rejection of Christ did not mean that God had rejected Israel. He would fulfill every one of his promises to them, including the millennial kingdom. And no doubt our Lord's teaching to them about his death and resurrection by the Jewish people was reflected in Paul's teaching in Romans 9, 10, and 11, as Paul taught that God has not forsaken Israel and that he would fulfill his word to them, including his promise of a coming kingdom. But it would appear, and this is the primary thing, it would appear that the primary issue that Jesus wanted his apostles to understand right now concerning the kingdom was that the content of their message to lost individuals would now be centered around his death and resurrection. In other words, what they needed to understand was that in declaring to people about Christ reigning as king over their hearts, that this message now involved believing in his death, burial, and resurrection. That is to say, they were to tell people not simply that Jesus was king, not simply that they needed to surrender to Jesus Christ as Lord over their lives, but that they, the men, the apostles, they were to explain Christ's suffering, the meaning of Christ's suffering on the cross as the substitutionary sin bearer and that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead and that now the way to submit to him as king was by repenting of their sin, turning from it and trusting him as their savior from sin based on his finished work on the cross. That had never really been explained to the apostles. You see, Jesus had spoken to them during his ministry of his upcoming death, but he hadn't really explained the significance of it. It wasn't until after his resurrection that he explained to the apostles the, the real meaning of his death and that their message to a lost world was to proclaim his death as the only way to experience the forgiveness of sins. They didn't understand that. They didn't know that. In fact, there were times when Jesus would speak to them about his upcoming death and, and they either didn't hear it or there was one time where Peter actually rebukes him and says, Lord, may it never be. That's when Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You don't understand. In fact, you know, this is what Jesus was teaching them during his 40 days of appearing to them. We know this because in Luke 24, we read these words. Notice Luke 24 starting in verse 44. This is part of these, this 40-day time period. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then, notice this, he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. For the first time, they get it now. They understand the meaning of the cross. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ would suffer and rise again from the dead the third day and that repentance for forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in his name all, to all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You're witnesses of these things. That's your message. Now, it's true he doesn't use the word kingdom here, but the point is the same. From now on, he's sending them forth with the message about his sufferings on the cross and repentance, including faith, for the forgiveness of sins. And preaching this, folks, they are preaching the kingdom of God. They're preaching the kingdom of God because it is through believing in his death for the forgiveness of their sins that people are brought into his kingdom. So how is, how, how is all of this related to Jesus preparing his apostles to be witnesses? And how does this apply to us? It's really not complicated. It's really very simple. Jesus wanted to make sure that his apostles understood the content of their message. He was sending them out to proclaim a message. They got to know what they're talking about. They have to know the right message. They were to be his witnesses by explaining to people that his suffering on the cross was as a sacrificial atonement for sinners and that the only way to be saved, the only way to be rescued from the penalty of their sin was to turn from their sin and trust him as their savior while submitting to him as their king. 
See, this is why Jesus spends so much time speaking to them about the things concerning the kingdom of God. He wanted them to understand that in proclaiming the gospel, the good news of salvation, they were actually proclaiming his kingdom. Proclaiming a message of the kingdom with him as king, ruling over the hearts and lives of those who would come to him as their savior from sin. It wasn't just follow me. Now it was believe on me and follow me. Believe on my death for your salvation. Repent of your sins and follow me. That's exactly what the apostles did. This is why in preaching the gospel, they did preach the message of repentance. I can't stress that enough because while the word repentance, literally the word means a change of mind. I want you to know it isn't merely an intellectual issue where, oh, now I think differently and it goes no further than that. I've just changed my mind, but it doesn't affect my life. That's not repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that always results in a change of behavior, a forsaking of of one's sin. It's always that. It's never just I intellectually just change my opinion. So in calling people to repentance and faith in Christ, The apostles were calling people to turn to Christ as king over their lives. No one, no one illustrates this better than the apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 26, we read that that he's standing, he's in the city of Caesarea, he's standing before King Agrippa, and he has the opportunity to explain to King Agrippa, Jewish king, his conversion story as well as the message that Jesus commissioned him to preach. This is very significant. Listen closely. Here's Paul's explanation. While so engaged as I was journeying to Damascus with the authority and commission of the chief priests, at midday, O king, I saw on the way a light from heaven, brighter than the sun, shining all around me and those who were journeying with me. And when we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice saying to me in the Hebrew dialect, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It's hard for you to kick against the goads. And and I said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I'm Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you, watch this, to appoint you a minister and a witness, not only of the things which you have seen, but also of the things in which I will appear to you, rescuing you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you. Now watch this. Here's here's your message, Paul. Here's your goal. Here's what you're trying to accomplish in my power. To open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God. That they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So, King Agrippa, I did not prove disobedient to the heavenly vision but kept declaring both to those of Damascus first and also at Jerusalem and then throughout all the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds appropriate to repentance. And let me tell you why this is so significant. Paul said that his message was to turn people from the dominion of Satan to the dominion of God. Now, that's really the same thing as saying they were turning from the kingdom of Satan to the kingdom of God. That's exactly the same thing. And he equated this turning from Satan to God, he called it repentance. Not merely a change of opinion, but a whole change of attitude. A change that involves forsaking sin and turning to God. So listen closely. If you are going to be an effective witness for Jesus Christ, then your message... Your witness, what you tell unbelievers about Christ, has to be the same as the apostles. You have to be right on the content of the gospel, which is, you can write this down, which is, you have to tell them that people are sinners, that they're a sinner. All of us are sinners. They need to know that God is holy, and therefore he must punish sin. That's why being a sinner is so serious. You need to tell them about Jesus Christ who is both God and man and he became a man so that he would die on the cross in the place of sinners. He was being punished in the place of sinners and that the only way, you must tell them, the only way to be saved from the penalty of your sins is by repenting and trusting Christ with a heart attitude of submission to him as king. 
See, to proclaim the gospel is to proclaim that Jesus is king and that those who would be forgiven of their sins must turn from their sin of being king over their own lives while crowning, king, or crowning Christ king of their life. That's really the essence of sin. I'm the king of my own life. I do whatever I want. You've got to repent of that if you're going to be saved. Folks, this is what we are called to witness about Christ. This is kingdom witnessing. This is gospel kingdom witnessing. So we better be sure that we aren't telling people the wrong message about Jesus by diluting his demands that he be king over them. Don't go picking fruit that isn't ripe because you want to say that this person prayed with me to receive Christ so they must be a Christian. Don't do that. If they come to Christ for salvation, they must come to him on his terms. And what are his terms? Repentance, faith, and surrendering to his authority over them. That means that you are not to tell somebody that, oh, just pray this prayer, just pray these words, and you'll be saved. How many young people have been told that by Christian parents, and they think they're saved, and there's never been salvation because there's never been repentance? But they'll tell you, oh, I, I'm, I'm sure I'm a Christian because I prayed these words with my mom, with my dad, well, now you're an adult. Has there ever been any desire in your life to follow Christ? Any, any evidence that you're a Christian? No. But when I was eight years old, I prayed and then I was baptized. That's not salvation. So make sure you don't tell them that. Don't tell them, just invite Jesus into your heart. And don't explain what that means of receiving him and bowing to his authority and trusting him as Savior. This means that we better not tell them that all they have to do to be saved is is intellectually acknowledge some facts about Christ. Just, just believe in your head some historical information. Like you would believe about Washington or Lincoln. Or believe like that about Christ. That's not salvation. That's not gospel kingdom witnessing. That is misrepresenting God. Now, listen, let's clarify this. Let's balance this. This doesn't mean that we tell people they have to reform their lives before they can be saved. That's not what we tell them. Or that every area of their life must be in full and total submission to him if they are to be a Christian. If that was the case, none of us could ever be Christians. But it does mean that those who come to Christ for salvation must come with hearts that recognize their sin and turn from it, relying on Christ's death as the only basis for the forgiveness of their sin with an attitude of surrendering their lives to him, which means a willingness a willingness for him to be Lord and King over every area of your life, holding back nothing. Let me me put it as lovingly and as forcefully as I can. There is no salvation in Christ if there has never been a repentant surrender to him as Lord and King. There is no salvation if someone has not repented and surrendered to him as Lord and King, regardless of what they say. And let me back this up with scripture. Paul said to the Romans in Romans chapter 14, verses 7 through 9, For no one of us lives for himself, and not one of us dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord, or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. Watch this. For to this end, meaning this is the purpose, for to this end Christ died and lived again that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Jesus Christ died that he might be Lord and King of your life. Now, if you're going to be an effective witness for Christ, then you have to know the content of the gospel, which is centered on trusting Christ's death for the forgiveness of sins while surrendering to his kingship. Is that what you tell others when you witness to them? Now, now, it may not be with those exact words, but it ought to be along those lines Let me ask you this. Do you know the content of the gospel? Do you actually know what the gospel message is made of? Listen, there are some Christians who have sat in church for many, many years, and they don't know how to sit down with an unbeliever and go through the plan of salvation, explain the gospel to them. If you're one of those people, then shame on you. Shame on you. This is the most important message. This is what it means to be a witness, and you don't know how to witness. Shame on you. And start listening to those who teach you, your Sunday school class, from this pulpit, others. Learn from them what you need to tell people about Christ. 
It's also very possible that you have assumed that you are a Christian because you believe certain facts about Jesus, or as I said earlier, you prayed with somebody, some words of salvation, right words, but not the right heart. If you have never repented of your sin, you're still the supreme ruler of your life instead of Jesus. And if that's the case, then you still need to be saved. So come to him. Come to him today with a heart of repentance, a heart of faith, trusting his death on your behalf for salvation, and surrender to him as your savior and king. That is the message we preach. Let's bow for prayer. Father, we thank you. We thank you that this is the gospel. It is good news, Lord. Without it, we have nothing to say to anybody. I pray, Lord, for those who have known you for many years and yet they, they really don't know what the content of the gospel is. Well, they can give bits and pieces, but never explain from A to B how a person can be saved. I pray that what they've heard today will move them to learn and move them to explain accurately the gospel. Lord, I pray for those who may have never really repented of their sin, that they're still running their life. They're still ruling their life. They're still the king over everything that they do and say, I pray that you would convict them of their need for Christ. I pray that you would, you would tear away from them false assurance because they prayed a prayer many years ago. I pray, Father, that you would show them in their hearts that true salvation comes to those who repent, trust you, and surrender. All of this, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, just before you leave, one final thing. I want to give a plug for tonight. We're dealing with an important subject on what it means to be filled with the Spirit. It's one of the most misunderstood concepts in Christian circles. You want to know what Scripture says about it, come back tonight. That's what we're dealing with. You are dismissed. Thank mm -hmm. you.